after this extremely important session where we discussed and saw how secular, rationalist, free-thinking, humanist individuals are creating serious changes in the environment that they are working in or living. Um, I think this is a matter of great inspiration. But how about now thinking of thinking globally while we have always been acting locally, which is the most important thing. And for this, there can be no other person than Roy Brown who could chair it. It was, after all, for those who do not know, IHU's then President Roy Brown, who declared in India his firm determination to move the IHU into the direction of working for the rights of the Dalits, the untouchables, and the subsequent developments in the IHU were geared for IHU to be able to handle this important responsibility. And we will have then the opportunity to discuss how to take the work, some of the ideas that we have explored, disagreed with or debated here um, yesterday and today onto the international level as well. Roy. <coughs> Thank you, Babu. Um, we are overrunning. I know this conference was supposed to end at 1 o'clock and it's now 1 o'clock, so uh, I have about 60 seconds for this final panel session. Can I ask the panelists to join me here? Dr. Berhardo, Professor Desai, uh, Matt, Keith, and... The mic is in. Because we're short of time, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask our speakers to limit themselves to five minutes each and to give us their views on how we should now move forward. I think we've all learned a huge amount this last two days about the scale of the problem, the intractability of the problem, the complexity of the problem. But I think we need, having seen what can be done locally, we now need to, as Babu has said, look at the global dimensions of this to see what we can do. And one of the things that we have done so far is to prepare a draft declaration from this conference, which I will read at the end, after each of these speakers has had their five minutes to put forward their ideas. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Verharder, who you already heard from, at this conference. He's the founder uh, of the uh, Ambedka Center for Justice and Peace, uh, which has worldwide branches, although he lives in Philadelphia. He has a very, very strong presence in India. Mrs. Uh, Meena Varma is director of the International Dalit Solidarity Network UK. Keith Wood, I think, probably knows no introduction to most of you. He is uh, secretary general or executive director, executive director of the National Secular Society in the UK. Matt Cherry is head of PR for IHEU based in New York. Leo Igwe is the um, West African representative for IHEU, and Professor Desai runs the Truth, is it the Truth Forum in, in um, Gujarat. So I'll start, if I may, uh, asking uh, Dr. Verharda to give us his thoughts. Thank you. Last couple of days, we got to know each other very well. Yogeshwar Hade, Ambedkar Center for Justice and Peace. Uh, our, our center has been focused on United Nations on the issue of eradication 
of caste system and practice of untouchability. This came after we studied how the apartheid of South Africa was dealt with by United Nations. Uh, I remember the statement of President Mandela on 3rd October 1994. He states there, welcoming the vanquishing of apartheid, President Mandela said that historic change has come about, not least because of the great efforts in which US, UN engaged to ensure the separation of the apartheid, apartheid crime against humanity. Apartheid, he added, represented the very opposite of all noble purposes for which UN was established and in fact constituted a brazen change to the very existence of the organization. So, when we looked at all the avenues which were open on at the international level, and since we were based in North America, we thought that the natural choice would be United Nations, except we had some misunderstanding that as soon as we go to the United Nations, all the problems of Dalits will be solved. That was not the case. And after 20 years also, I'm still trying to learn what else we can do to move this machinery. In 1991, we brought this issue originally in the working group on indigenous population as Dalits are the indigenous peoples of India. Thereafter, we went to 1993 World Conference on Human Rights. There, the Dalit issue was uh, primarily presented. In uh, 1995, the World uh, Summit on Social Development. In 2001, on World Conference uh, Against Racism. And Continuously, we had been participating in different sessions of the United Nations, obviously. What this did is, it, in 1996, Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination studied the India report, and because of our extensive lobbying and substantial documentation, they questioned India why they failed up to now to eradicate the caste system. That started a debate in the United Nations. And 1997, Committee on Civil and Political Rights, Thereafter, the Committee on Child Rights in 2000. All these documents are available on our website. But this helped to highlight the issue. Number two, we did not stop there. We have formed a group in India of uh, Ambedkar Center for Justice and Peace, which is working and dealing directly with the human rights violations on a, in the Maharashtra state. This has brought many issues. It is, there is not much time now to talk about the actual atrocity cases that we are dealing with. And it is helping to a great extent. We have also hosted the major human rights education, promotion, protection, and implementation conferences in Bombay. And now we are on the verge of going it much bigger at a state level. And our focus is basically the human rights education. As Dr. Ambedkar says that the political democracy cannot survive without the foundation of the social democracy. So we are organizing in that direction. I think that there is not much time. <laughs> he is looking at the watch and he had been very strict about the time, so I better listen to him. I have got a lot, lot of things to tell, but I think that I will have to do it next time. Thank you. Well, Yogesh actually managed to stay within the five minutes, so I'm going to talk really, 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 really quickly. <laughs> and if you don't understand, then you'll have to listen to it later. Um, I'm the director of DSN UK and actually an executive group member of IDSN, which is the International Dalit Solidarity Network. The IDSN was formed in 2000, and we consist of national advocacy platforms in India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, and Nepal, as well as Dalit Solidarity Networks throughout the UK. There are also international associates, which include Human Rights Watch, uh, the uh, Lutheran World Federation, IMADA, which is the international movement against the um, racial discrimination, anti-slavery, etc., etc. Um, our main focuses are um, on the UN, the European Union, within the private sector, and general networking and coordination. I'm not going to focus too much on the UN because I know these guys here are much more expert than I, than I am on that. But um, just to say that the IDSN does actually uh, spend an awful lot of time in Geneva and it is uh, still working on principles and guidelines for the elimination of caste-based discrimination, which I think has just been 
um, taken up by the hu new Human Rights Council Advisory um, Committee. The highlights um, from the European Union, can I just say, actually was a European resolution which was passed in February 2007. Um, the same principle that happened to the US resolution of last year happened with the European resolution where the focus of attention was on the abuse of human rights suffered by India's Dalits and the Euro European Parliament called on the European Commission to raise the issue of caste discrimination during EU-India summits and in other dialogues. This has since been stalled. And can I just say the reason why it has been stalled is mostly because of UK MEPs, um, mostly um, one of which was Nina Gill and the other which is Charles Tannock. I am naming and shaming here. Um, so moving on uh, to the private sector, which is also part of the internationalization of the issue, because we are working through UK companies to raise the issue with their, with their headquarters in India. We've introduced affirmative action programs, a Dalit discrimination check. Again, it's just chipping away at the moment because I think somebody said yesterday, why on earth would a UK company do something that actually Indian companies weren't doing? What we're doing is raising awareness of the issue and making sure that they know exactly what is happening to the Dalits and caste discrimination within um, India. If they want to sign up to Global Sullivan Principles, then they should be looking at the whole, whole range of human rights abuses. We would like them to sign up to the Ambedkar Principles, but um, that's a step too far for most of them. We um, have also got country developments in South Asia um, and the DSNs in Europe are, are working um, along the global stage. Uh, within the UK, our main campaign at the moment is called Foul Play and it's asking for the abolition of manual scavenging by the Commonwealth Games in 2010. We're working on the three principles of the Commonwealth Games Federation, which are humanity, equality and destiny. Now, none of these things are actually shown to Dalits in India, and we are asking Delhi Commonwealth Games to honor humanity, equality, and destiny. What we'd like to see, obviously, is an end to caste discrimination. If this happens in my lifetime, I would be a very happy woman, but I believe it will happen. But ideally, what I want to see an end to is the caste system. That's it for now, thank you. Keith Porteous Wood. Uh, I'll tr also try to keep within the time. I think what we need to do is to try a lot harder to engage the media uh, and modern communication methods such as the internet and blogs. And I think that what we, the way that we need to do that is actually to go out and to speak to journalists uh, and also to engage them at a human level. I think that's extraordinarily important. And we want at the both, uh, to do two things in that respect. I think that the best thing is to, on the one hand, uh, show them examples of, of individual people and the inhumanity, the indignity, and the injustice to which they have been subjected. And also, I think, to show aspirant examples of where people have overcome uh, these terrible difficulties that have been put in their way and managed to, uh, to, to very much uh, lead more uh, satisfactory lives. And I've, I've been inspired by the people that I've seen here that have managed to do that. Um, I'd like to echo what Lord Averbury said yesterday, that um, uh, the it's important to have independent surveys to be able to demonstrate uh, how uh, bad the problem is uh, and so that it's not just talk, it is actually backed up by independent figures. And with a bit of ingenuity, that doesn't have to be so expensive to do. I work closely with Lord Averbury and the Lords uh, and, and we, we've put down some uh, uh, amendments already uh, before the meeting yesterday, we talked after the meeting yesterday, uh, and as a direct result of that, there has already been a further agreement by the Liberal Democrats uh, in, in the United Kingdom Parliament to put down the kind of amendment that uh, Lord Averbury and I were talking about yesterday. Um, uh, and, and I've already spoken to the person who will actually put that forward in the House uh, in the next few days. So that's a positive outcome of this conference, 
uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the work that we've done, and I hope that you're pleased with that. I'll pass on your thanks to Lord Averbury. Um, I, I think that really runs me into the last element of, my, of, of, the, of all we have time to say, which is I think we really do have to engage very hard with the democratic process uh, and international organizations. Um, and, and that I hope that some of the things that we've talked about in the last few days in, in terms of doing that, and even the example I just gave, um, and remembering just how many Dalits there are and that they have votes, that we've really got to use every lever that we have. And I think that uh, with uh, that, that monopolizing that and really using that leverage uh, is also a key way to, to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Matt Cherry. I am an international representative for the IHEU and uh, head of the IHEU delegation to the UN in New York. And in that capacity, I am also um, vice president of the United Nations NGO Committee on Freedom of Religion or Belief. And I have to say, I, I'm glad I'm speaking at the end of this conference because I came very much as a student, not as a teacher. And I've learned a huge amount from all of the speakers and contributors here. It's been a very enlightening and uh, stimulating experience. I think we've learned how severe and uh, dreadful the situation is around the world. And I hope we're inspired to move forward. And what I would like to talk about briefly is some of the uh, ideas that came to me as I listened about how as Keith said, we can use levers, and we can use levers, I think, at the United Nations uh, using existing mechanisms to advance the cause of uh, fighting caste discrimination. And since um, my primary area at the UN has been freedom of religion or belief, I'll, I'll touch on that to start with. And I think in talking about that, we'll see some of the, um, the ways in which we can use uh, the UN and its resources and its precedents uh, in other fields. Now, freedom of religion or belief is often used to, I think, to kind of cover over religious abuses. And you often hear at the UN when you we criticize a human rights abuse which is done in the name of religion, the, the response is, you're, you know, you're attacking my freedom of religion. And this, of course, is complete nonsense because freedom of religion or belief, which is protected in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, given the force of law in Article 18 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, does not give license to abuse any other human rights in the name of religion. It does not excuse that. All it does is to protect people's right to practice and follow their own religion or belief in so much as it does not infringe on the rights of others. And it's worth noting that it protects the right to criticize religious beliefs and practices, protects the right to leave a religion, and protects our right to be humanists and to manifest our beliefs. And it's also worth noting, I think, that the, the, U, the only UN declaration on freedom of religion or belief is titled, and I'll try and get this right, 1981, um, United Nations Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and Discrimination Based on Religion or Belief. So the very focus of the title is the elimination of religious hatred. And I think we can use this very much in, in trying to combat uh, religious discrimination based on, on caste and, and belief in superstition and impurity. I also think, as well as um, trying to use those mechanisms at the UN and making sure things like caste are included in the universal periodic reviews of countries, and I was shocked to hear that uh, uh, Lord Avery say that uh, the UPR for uh, India never mentioned caste discrimination, and that seems to be an, an egregious omission. 
But I think we can also use our alliances there. Uh, Tina Ramirez yesterday talked about how the US government uses US legislation based on these international standards of religious freedom to enforce some of these standards as much as they can. And it's not just about promoting awareness of these problems. They can actually use national laws to stop the source of some of these problems. For example, using US laws against religious hatred to stop the funding by American Brahmins of religious hatred and caste discrimination in India. And I think that's a powerful tool that we can make use of in other countries too. And I also know that we work with NGOs who specialize in the field of religious freedom from different life stances. They may be Christian or Muslim or, or whatever their beliefs, but we can share common ground on some of these issues where people have been denied their freedom of conscience. But there are many other mechanisms and tracks at the UN, and many of them are, are more substantial than freedom of religion. I won't go into them in detail. I wanted to go into this one in detail because I think we can mirror it in the other areas. But there's women's rights, there's children's rights, there's racism, there's la the whole labor field of the ILO, the International Labor Office of Business and Economics. And I discovered at this conference that most of the world's slaves, most of the indentured laborers are untouchables. We can use those mechanisms, education and social development. There's many fields at the UN where we can educate people, educate other NGOs, educate the UN itself, and build alliances to use existing mechanisms to fight caste discrimination and untouchability. I think there's a great deal of work to do. Thank you for teaching me that. <laughs> All right, um, once again, my name is Leo Igwe, and I represent IHEU in West Africa and the uh, and African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Well, um, I want to quickly say that uh, actually I find my work there a bit depressing. Let me tell you why. Because um, what all the African states, what they're doing is honing their skills to deny and dodge any kind of responsibility for human rights abuses. They dismiss, they deny, they come up with all words, uh, adjectives to qualify and uh, make nonsense of any kind of human rights uh, uh, abuse, maybe, or any kind of concern raised by NGOs. But um, I think it is important we are there and we're going to remain there and uh, we also will find a way to counteract uh, some of the uh, you know, some of the strategies or some of the schemes they're using. Well, uh, as you must have seen on, our, on the IHU website, uh, we made a statement at the last uh, session in Banjul, and um, of course concerning uh, case discrimination uh, uh, in Africa. And uh, one of the countries, coincidentally, my own country, reacted, uh, dismissing that there was nothing like that and that uh, our, the, what we said, our statement was wrong, false, unfounded. So many other ways they tried to uh, get the commission to understand that uh, you know, there was nothing like uh, case-based discrimination in Nigeria. Um, well, what do we do in the light of that? Like I said, we are not going to give up. First of all, we, we have to keep pushing and we need to ensure that case-based discrimination becomes or gets into the regional human rights agenda, African human rights agenda. So we keep mentioning it, we keep coming up with it, with instances and all that. What else do we need to do? We need to publicize the injustice or injustices or acts of indignity, human rights abuses, uh, lower caste people suffer, like the attacks, everything, where it happened and how it happened. We need to get that out. Just like uh, I think Matthew talked about the media, you know, we need to get that uh, reported in the media. Another thing, we need to mobilize and galvanize lower caste uh, communities. We need to empower them so that they can come out. Many of them cannot come out, many of them cannot speak out. That's why sometimes people will say they don't know that caste-based discrimination, you know, occurs in Africa. It's because they, many of these groups are maybe passive. Uh, we need to support them and get them so that their voices will be heard. Uh, we need also practical interventions, like now 
when some families they support, suffer attacks or people, some lower caste people, they attacked or they suffer case-based violence, we need to go in to support them and make, publicize the support. Yes, just like now they adopted the Dalit village. After doing it, we need to put that on the internet so that you know that there is something going on and that we're empowering Dalit people, let's say in India and in other parts of the world. Um, like I said, firm, persistent, resolute, proactive approach. We're not going to give up. We keep moving, we keep pushing the, the platform. We need to partner with other NGOs working uh, on the issue. There are other NGOs in Niger working on caste-based discrimination and on slavery. We need to partner with them. And uh, we also we have heard about the International Solidarity Network. We need to work with them uh, to you know, raise the profile of the campaign. We need to support cultural reforms, the reform of tradition in, our, in, in Africa. We, we also need to reinforce our you know, campaign against uh, superstition because that's part of it. We are, we, then we also need to tackle harmful tradition. There, there's a, an organization, they call it um, EAC, Inter-African Committee, they work on harmful traditions. Sometimes we can partner with them because uh, in, my, in my community in Nigeria, Usu practice is a harmful tradition. I think that's about all. Thank yeah. I'm Bidhi Desai from India. <clears throat> I think we have had uh, enough uh, exhaustive discussion and analysis of the whole issue. Now is the time that uh, we come to some plan of action. So I suggest a few points. Uh, humanism is not merely a philosophical or intellectual tradition, but also a plan of action. The efficiency of humanism is intricately bound with its ability to tackle the real life problems that confront those who are pushed to the bottom of the society. Humanism has to be intensely political in its actions, social in its commitments, and egalitarian in its outlook, as it is humanism and humanism alone that holds forth great promises for mankind. Now, how can we alter the situation of the untouchables suffering social, economic, and cultural oppression? Education has failed, democratic process proving ineffective. The so-called modern culture does not reach out to them. As humanists, we have to look for durable and effective instrumental mechanisms to restore the untouchables as normal human beings of self-worth and dignity. To enable the untouchables to enjoy the civil and democratic rights is a very significant issue for all of us to ponder over and come up with relevant rights, relevant and rights-responding solutions to the issues of the untouchables. I'll just try to... Uh, the macro approach would demand transformations in all aspects of political, social, economic and cultural and needs active collaboration of all the major actors like statesmen, bureaucrats, educationists, employers and others in redesigning the policies affecting the interest of the untouchables, including women and children. The entire social planning process need reorientation in this venture. Dialogue among the developmental agencies and also networking among across regions is also vital in this undertaking. One key area is formal education, humanist education, as we have been emphasizing, which can also be an important agent of social change. Primary education is very significant, both in terms of socio-economic uh, cultural reality and awareness of human rights must be introduced at the primary level. The understanding that human rights to education, employment, housing, health care are basic, which must be internalized by the children at the primary level. Considering the enormity of the problems, we have to think of innovative solutions based on ground realities the mindset of the out oppressors and the social environment that pervades in the various countries. Caste discrimination is a deep-rooted cultural practice and requires intensive public education, sensitization and enlightenment. Humanists have to increase the social pressures and create an environment of equality. It is very wrongly con considered by many that the problems of the untouchables should be dealt with by untouchables and Dalits themselves, and non-Dalits should not take over this campaign. 
You see, what I, what I believe is social injustice can best be uh, removed only when those who are not the victims of social justice feel the pain of the victims of the social injustice in equal measure. So the right thing that we have done, uh, that the adopt a Dalit village, we have to keep in mind three points. First, let us go to the basis of human life. Let us listen to the small man and woman. Let us learn from his or her small successes and failures and his or her long struggle to survive. Secondly, we should all be prepared to go for ruthless criticism and merciless analysis. Our diagnosis and prognosis should not be marketed, uh, should not be marked by fragmentation of problems, temporary diffusion of crisis, advocism of solutions, and symptomatic treatment that would amount to evading the real issues. Thirdly, let us start removing obstacles and dismantling structure we deny food, freedom, and uh, freedom and justice to human beings. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. You stuck to your time and every one of you had some very, very constructive <coughs> thoughts there. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've prepared a draft declaration which I'd like to read to you to actually provide something in the way of concrete outcome from this conference. And I'm not able to display it on the screen, unfortunately. I'll read it to you, and if you have any comments before we decide whether to adopt this or not, um, we'll have a few moments at the end. I'll read you this, it will take a few minutes. We, the delegates to the First World Conference on Untouchability meeting in Conway Hall, London, on the 9th and 10th of June, 2009, under the aegis of the International Humanist and Ethical Union, hereby declare as follows. Discrimination based on work or descent is widespread throughout much of Asia and in several countries in Africa. Extreme forms of this discrimination, untouchability, involve restrictions on the employment open to certain groups, prohibition of intermarriage, and restrictions on the use of water supplies, places of worship, and even public roads. These restrictions are often enforced by violence and even murder. In the India outlawed such discrimination in its 1950 constitution, has passed laws against the practice since then, and has set up exemplary programs of positive discrimination, such as reservation of education places and government employment. Um, nevertheless, the law is not enforced, and caste discrimination remains endemic in India. Similar practices remain widespread in other countries in South Asia, in Japan, Nigeria, Mauritania, and other African states. Untouchability is the most widespread, pernicious, and intractable form of discrimination, affecting the lives of millions of men and women, and with negative impact on the lives of untold millions of children and their potential for growth and development. An estimated 250 million people worldwide are victims of such discrimination. Yet many of the states concerned deny that such discrimination exists in their territories. Recalling the recommendation of the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination of the 29th of November 2002, that such discrimination is a form of racism. Welcoming the resolution of the European Parliament of the 1st of February 2007 on the situation of Dalits in India, and recognizing that the solution to this problem requires publicity, education of both the oppressors and the oppressed, and the passage and effective implementation of legislation, we call upon one, all states where the practice of untouchability or discrimination based on work or descent is prevalent to introduce legislation where it does not yet exist, to outlaw this practice, and to undertake training programs for all sections of society, including public officials, the police, and the judiciary, aimed at the elimination of the practice and at ensuring that these laws are enforced. Two, we call upon the United Nations Human Rights Council to recognize the need for action on this issue to appoint a special rapporteur and working group to study the full impact of such discrimination around the world, to set up an office or an observatory to receive complaints from victims of such discrimination, and to support programs of human rights education towards eliminating social resistance to change.
Thirdly, we call on individuals and organizations throughout the world to create and support campaigns to raise awareness of the problem through media coverage, the creation of secular, organization, secular social organizations based on the principles of humanism, justice, and equality, and by pursuing effective and timely redress through the courts. The conference further resolves, one, to communicate this declaration and its recommendations to the UN Secretary General and the High Commissioner for Human Rights and to the delegations of all member and observer states of the Human Rights Council. And two, to set up an ad hoc committee to follow up the findings, recommendations and resolutions of this conference and to request IHEU to initiate the creation of a global secular alliance against untouchability. Does anyone have, want to vote against that? <laughs> no. Sure. Uh, I think it's, a, it's an excellent uh, resolution, you know. Uh, I, I'm very pleased, you know, that it's uh, uh, so detailed. You know, there's a, there's a lot of things in there, right, which I, I, I wanted to see myself, yeah. There's one thing that I like to sort of comment upon, and that is the, uh, the concept of dissent, work or dissent. Now, as you are aware that in Durban in 2001, the World, World Conference Against Racism, the demand by the Dalits was that caste is racism and worse. Because what the Indian government tried to argue was that caste is completely different from racism. It is not like racism at all. What they were actually trying to say was that caste is merely a, some sort of social convention that it, it wasn't discriminatory, it was what people choose to do in their private life. Now obviously the Dalits you know, fought against this and they said that it is actually more insidious than racism because it operates at so many different levels. So the Indian government was able, by one form or another, to substitute the word caste by work or dissent. Now this, this in itself is highly deceptive it is deceptive for a number of reasons, and I'll, I'll put the, 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 the foremost reason for that. You can be born a Brahmin, but you don't have to be a priest, but you still remain a Brahmin. You can be, you can be working in IT, you can be in the army, you could even be doing some manual work, right? But you will always remain a Brahmin. So your caste will always link you with a number of things in the, in the, in the Indian society. So if, I'm, if I may very respectfully request the chair to include the word caste in there, yes. and you can say, i.e., work or dissent. I mean, I have no objection to work or dissent. You can still say that, but you can say, i.e. But the, the word caste must be included in there, and that would be a very progressive step. Can that, I suggest that? Yeah. Well, I think that's what we have to keep discrimination based on work or dissent in there, because yes, that's please. the wording of the uh, committee on elimination of all forms of racial discrimination, which they, it is that wording that they recognize. However, we could add, where well, we've said, uh, call upon all states where the pacts of untouchability, caste discrimination, or discrimination based on work or dissent. Yes, mm. yes. Is that well, okay? I'm saying that the word caste must appear in there. Right? Keep everything else in there, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> then with small... Um, I'm sorry, right? Yeah. I mean, continue, right? This is probably not... Uh, too related to this, but since we are coming to the end of the conference, right, I, I wish to sort of make a couple of points, yeah? Are they related to the declaration? Yes, uh, I think two of the things that the, the rationalists and humanists can do in this country, one is obviously to educate themselves, which we have made a wonderful start on today, and, and yesterday and today, right? And the other thing is a prime concern to the Dalits in this country, and also in, in the diaspora everywhere, is that the organizations like the Hindu Council and Hindu Forum have actually managed to take out all references to the caste system from the school textbooks in this country behind the scenes. And if something could be done on that, educating our children to know the truth, what is going out there, I think that would be wonderful. If, if something along those lines could be incorporated, I should be most grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Roy, could I, I, that really echoes something like it's only a 15 second intervention. Um, 
I think that we need somewhere to have one sentence in recognising the, the enemy, what's actually causing this, and actually mention, I think I put something like uh, religion's vested interest in perpetuating this or actually mentioning Hinduism or whatever, but I think we actually, I, I think we do have to say where it's coming from. If I may say so, religious, religious and business interests, because this is being driven by people who have lot, lots of money. Right. One of the phrases we have here is, yet many of the states concerned deny that such discrimination exists in their territories, and we can mention other resistance to the idea of this. So sometimes, sometimes for religious or business reasons. Right. Uh, somewhere I think it's a late thought now. Uh, recalling the IHU World Congress Resolution of 1999, ah. where we called upon the world to reject caste and, mm -hmm. uh, and actually say that Caste is what should be outlawed. Uh, so if we can put that clause in, we can supply the text later. Yes, okay. Was that, was that substituting what I said, or was it in addition? No. Oh, was it, or was it, sorry, was it substituting your... It's just shorter than your 15 seconds. No, I don't think, but it, but it, it, hasn't, mentioned, it hasn't mentioned the religious aspect specifically. It's different things. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So we haven't finished the asking point. I just want to make yes, a small point. <clears throat> I was there in the committee when this discussion was going on in the United Nations. Uh, the committee on, third committee, gave the uh, final stamp that dissent means caste, and Indian government should not challenge it, period. So we can also write dissent in bracket caste, which was the judgment of the United Nations 1996 judgment and committee. Dissent is recognized in Article 1 in the, in the <clears throat> Third uh, convention, Committee on Elementary Services. Okay, that's good. I can do that. Just uh, one point. It's very written that the state where which practices untouchability, physical or otherwise. Can you put that? Yeah, that's it. Physical or otherwise. There is just one sentence. The states where which practices untouchability, and you can add physical or otherwise. It becomes quite long now. All states with a practice of untouchability, physical or otherwise, or discrimination based on work or descent, caste discrimination, is prevalent. Yeah. I'll put all those words in there, but try and organize it. Yeah, I think that will come up quite good. I have a very quick comment. Um, mine is about positive discrimination, which actually has a negative connotation. I would, I would suggest putting action. positive action. Yeah, yeah, I wonder about that. I think that's right. I think uh, the state here says a valid point. So I'm wondering whether you want to give up one minute. When we were talking, uh, sorry, when we were talking about uh, caste and descent, but yes, only the untouchability was uh, abolished, not the caste. Mm. Yes. And then when we talked about the descent, yet that doesn't give the good point. People don't understand what's the descent. Yes. The because it's so hidden there, it doesn't, I remember the last time we did say into bracket we should put untouchability. Accepted, yes. I'll, I'll say it has passed laws against untouchability. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ambedkar wrote many books. First book is Annihilation of Caste. Caste is a notion in the minds of people. That notion should be abolished by law. All books, all chapters, which are teaching uh, this notion of uh, varna and caste, it, they must be abolished by law. This, they are in circulation everywhere. This Bhagavad Gita and all these things, um, they are teaching caste system. So I request the panel to throw light on this uh, subject. Otherwise, there is no use. Thank you. Essentially, to include the past. Okay. Can we move? Thank you. It's okay. Okay. Can I now move that the conference adopt this declaration? Yes. Could we just anyone vote against adopting this declaration? No abstentions. Any abstentions? Then it's adopted unanimously. Thank you. Excellent. Well done, Roy. Can we have a vote of thanks for Roy, please? Yeah. 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 Extensions.
votes against. Uh, Thank you. Uh, one last <laughs> comment. Would any of you who would like to be part, part of the proposed ad hoc committee to follow up on this, give me your email addresses right now. Can somebody else collect them, Palace, for, yeah. on behalf of Roy? I'll give you mine. Yeah, give you, can you collect them from everybody else and then write yeah. them and give them to Roy? Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank thank you. Okay, may I thank you, uh, well, all the people who contribute, contributed to this, uh, the success of this conference. And I'm very, very happy that as uh, International Humanist and Ethical Union, we really took the subject now and we will start it and we will not leave it uh, in this Conway Hall. We will bring it to the rest of the world and I hope that we will succeed. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>